Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, this hour would you allow the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And would you transform us by your holy and perfect word. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever wanted to give up? I hear some murmuring out there. Have you ever wanted to give up? Many of you know that on Tuesday and Thursday nights here in the CLC at 6.30 p.m., a group of us gather for what's called the Faith Boot Camp. And it is an exercise class where we use HIT training. That is H-I-I-T. It stands for High Intensity Interval Training. And basically the gist of that exercise plan is that you work out again and again, and you don't let your body have time to slow down and catch your breath. You're squeezing all the oxygen out of the muscles. We run, we jump, we exercise our legs, our arms, our core. And there are certain exercises that I don't mind doing. I don't love running, but I'll do it. I don't love doing bicep curls all the time, but I'll do them. But there are some exercises that I really don't appreciate doing a whole lot. After one round of sit-ups, I think I've done all the core exercise that I want to do. And I'm tempted at times to quit. My lungs, my body, my muscles, my mind, it wants to stop. But thankfully I have a coach and I have other people I'm working out with who encourage me to stay on, they encourage me to press on in the exercise. But I remember whenever I was in high school and I played football, occasionally during a practice, something would happen to a player, whether the coach yelled at them or they just, you know, someone says something to them, and they would walk off the field to the locker room, hang up their cleats, and they were done. They were off the team. They were, my coach, there were no second chances to come back on if you did that in practice. What are some of the things in your life? What are some of the things that you have wanted to quit? Particularly because they were too hard. What were the pressures that you felt or that your family felt? that led you to feel that way. And here's another question for you. Did you quit? There are plenty of things in life where it is okay to quit. Right? The other day I went to get my hair cut, and I walked in, I put my name on the list, and the hairdresser said, well, it's going to be about an hour and a half before I can get to you. And so I quit. I went up and I marked my name <laughs> off the list, and I found another hairdresser 10 minutes down the road who could get me in right away. But there are other things that are more serious. What if you were working a job and you're continually harassed by your supervisor and your coworkers? Or you're in a relationship where you're constantly abused, whether that's verbally or emotionally or even physically. In those situations, you should most likely quit. But there are also many situations in life where it's not okay to throw in the towel. Right? If you are married, if you have a marriage, it's not okay whatever you can have a disagreement or whatever things are hard for you to just say, well, I'm done with this. I've disagreed too long. I'll see you later. It's not okay. You have to persevere in those moments. Or if you're a parent and you have children, right? The thing is, once you take that baby home from the hospital, that's your baby. And there are many people who do abandon their families. They abandon their children. But God would have us endure and press on and labor. All those things get hard. And maybe even sometimes, you feel like you want to give up on faith. You want to give up on the church. You've, have a, you've had enough of missing out on what the world has to offer. Or you've experienced enough conflict and now you're just ready to stop. 
Well, as we come today to the book of Hebrews, we find a sermon delivered to a group of people who are suffering and who are ready to quit. There's likely a group of Jewish Christians, and you have to understand that during this era in the Roman Empire, wherever you lived in the empire, you could have peace, but you had to do a few things. You had to sac make sacrifices to the emperor and worship him as a god. And the Jews, they were stubborn monotheists. They only believed in their god, and they wouldn't do it. And so they eventually got some concessions. They didn't have to do the offerings to the emperor. They were kind of a persecuted, not, not always persecuted, they were always a small minority. They didn't have the privileges of being in the places of power, but they could exist. They could worship God on their own terms. Things weren't great, but they were okay. And then all of a sudden, some people who are Jews and some are Gentiles show up and say, listen, the Jewish Messiah that we've been expecting has showed up. His name is Jesus, and he's actually the Son of God. He became a human and died on the cross for our sins. Not only that, he rose up from the dead, and now he's with God in heaven. And if you believe in him, you can have forgiveness as well. And so, if you're a Jew and you hear this message, you think God is acting. He's fulfilling the promises that he made to us. And so you believe. You're filled with the Holy Spirit, and you see miraculous things happening. People are healed. Demons are cast out. Lives are being transformed. But after a while, after a few months, maybe a few years, it's not as exciting as it used to be. You see, the local government is putting pressure on you because you're disrupting the local economy because you're not buying sac meat to sacrifice anymore. And the local Jews who didn't believe in Jesus, they think that you've abandoned them and that you're a traitor to God. And so they're inciting the local authorities against you. And so you have this temptation. I love God. I want to worship God. But this persecution business, I don't want any of that. Maybe I'll just go back to doing things the old way. My family and friends, they'll take me back if I go. If I just abandon Jesus and go back to the synagogue, I'll be okay. And it's to this group that the letter of Hebrews is written. It's actually written like a sermon. Elaborate on what the author of Hebrews is doing. He says, if that's what you're going to say, then I'll go point by point through the Old Covenant. And I'll look at every aspect and show you that it's worth it. That Jesus is making it worth it. And so today, as we come to this passage 2,000 years later, I think it's just as relevant for us today as it was then. And I hope that today, as we study the passage, that you'll see that by Christ's atoning work on the cross and his priestly work in heaven... Jesus gives us access to the Father in order that we might live confident Christian lives in an ever-hostile world. Let me say that again. By his atoning work on the cross and his priestly work in heaven, Jesus gives us access to the Father in order that we might live confident Christian lives in an ever-hostile world. Well, first, it's important to understand that Jesus gives us permanent access to God. All right, in order to understand the book of Hebrews, you kind of need to understand some things about ancient Judaism as it's, we read in the Old Testament. You know that the Jews, when they worshiped God, they came to a temple. And in the temple, there were two rooms. There was the holy place, and that's where the priests would go in and they would do their work. But then there was a room off of that, separated by a curtain, called the most holy place. Or maybe you've heard it called the holy of holies. And only one person had access to that room. And only one time of year. The high priest could go in on the Day of Atonement, and he had to make sacrifices to purify himself. He had to purify the tent, and then he had to purify his clothing, and then he had to purify his own body, and offering a sacrifice for each and every one of those. And then and only then could he access God in the Holy of Holies and offer a sacrifice. Jewish tradition says that they would, for the priest would tie a rope around his ankle in case he died while he was in there, that no one else could go in because only the high priest was permitted to go. And if he died, they could just pull him out. Well, the author of Hebrews, he says that Jesus gives us access to God. And let's read, if you have your text open, in verses 19 to 21. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, the author of Hebrews has been building an argument since he started the beginning of the book. I think if you've ever studied Hebrew in your personal devotion, I think that there's a whole lot of payoff if you sit down and read Hebrews in one setting. Because like I said, it's a sermon. It's intended to be heard all at one time. 
But I'll summarize basically what he said. God has sent his son Jesus to earth. And Jesus has special access to God because unlike the angels, unlike Moses, unlike Joshua, he was the son of God. And not only that, but he became a human for our sake. And so that he could be tempted in every way, just like us, but overcome temptation. And he became a man, he died on the cross, and now he ascended into heaven to be our great high priest. But unlike the other priests, he can actually go straight to the Holy of Holies. And he's not just offering any type of sacrifice, but rather he's bringing his own blood on our behalf for our forgiveness. He mediates a new covenant, which is better than the former covenant, because he's able to give us perfect and permanent forgiveness. Jesus takes the access that he has to God and he confers it to us if we believe in Jesus. That way, that's why I say it's important that we have access to the God of the universe by trusting in Jesus Christ. I remember one time, I went, I've only been to one NBA game in my entire life, and don't worry, this isn't a story about basketball, so. Uh, but I was on a trip to Memphis, on a mission trip, and we had one day off. We had one day free, and our team leader was able to find cheap tickets on the internet for like seven bucks a piece for our whole team to go see the Memphis Grizzlies play the Dallas Mavericks. So we go to FedEx Forum, and we take our seats in the balcony. And when I say that we were the next to last row in the arena, we were the next to last row in the arena. But the game was on a Wednesday night. The arena was only about halfway full. And so as we looked around, there were plenty of empty seats, not only in the balcony, but even on the lower level. And one of the people on my, in my group, he was a big NBA fan, and he said, man, I'd love to just be down on that lower level. And so we went, we went out in the lobby, and thought, well, maybe we can, you know, just walk. We've already got tickets we're in the arena. Maybe we can just go down and sit in the lower level. But there were security guards checking tickets. And they didn't check everyone's tickets, so we thought, well, maybe if we look confident, like we know where we're going, we find a group of people who are going to the lower level, maybe they'll just, you know, whisk us in with everyone else. And so we tried, and we got there, and he asked for a ticket. What did our ticket say? You can sit in the balcony. So he said, no, I'm sorry, you're not getting down here on the lower level. We tried two more times, and we failed two more times. We thought that by having confidence of our own, we could access the lower level. But there was only one way we could go do that. We, could, we would have to go outside, buy a new ticket, and go back inside. However, there, I think, is another way we could have gotten down on the lower level. I think if the owner of the Memphis Grizzlies had sent his son out to the lobby to get us, and he took us by hand, and he walked just past the security guards, I don't think they would say anything to him. And not only could we be in the lower level, we probably could have courtside seats sitting right next to the owner and his son to watch this game being played. The owner doesn't have any problem with access, and he can confidently go to the right, right next to where the action is happening. I hope you can understand the, the analogy here. The two levels of FedEx form are like the two rooms in the temple. But there's nothing that we could do, though, to access that inner level, that inner room in the temple, the Holy of Holies. But as Hebrews 6.19 says, we have a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. Christ is a sure and steady anchor. Because of his death, because he's able to shed his own blood, and because he is the great high priest, he goes where we couldn't go. And he gives us access. Therefore, we can confidently approach the throne of grace. And having established everything that Jesus accomplished for us, the author of Hebrews then shares three privileges that we have as Christians. And these are our responsibility to take advantage of. The first is that we can draw near to God in purity and holiness. Look at verse 22. He says this, Therefore, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. We can draw close to God without fear, without doubt. This is what full assurance of faith means. It means that when I access, when I approach God, I don't have to fear that He is angry with me, that His holiness might consume me, because I've been covered by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, I can be totally assured 
And I'm able to do this, it says, with a true heart. Let us draw near with true hearts. For much of Israel's history, the people of God did not have a true heart to him. And Moses actually knew this. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 4, he says, But to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand, or eyes to see, or ears to hear. This is despite the fact that God commanded the people to love him with their whole heart, and all their might, and all their strength. But under the ministry of the new covenant, God not only purifies our body, but he purifies our conscience. This is what Hebrews says in chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. He says this, and this may be familiar to you. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a pepper, if these sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience? How much more can he purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? In order to please God, we must receive new hearts. I preached about this a few weeks ago from the book of Ezekiel. That God himself must take out our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh. If you are in Christ today, you have a level of freedom from sin that all who lived under the old covenant did not enjoy. We're free from sin. We don't have to sin anymore. We can obey God with our whole hearts. And now there are still times in our life where sin seems to ensnare us. We know that the enemy would love to lay a trap to cause us to stumble. But the truth is that we can draw near to God. We can draw near to Him in prayer. We can draw near to Him. So the first implication of Christ's priestly work is that we should draw near to God confidently. The second implication is this in verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. It would benefit us to look, this is a short verse, I just want to take a quick examination of the words here. It says, let us hold fast, let us cling to, let us hold on to the confession, that is what we profess, what we believe, of our hope. What does it mean when the Bible uses the word hope? Normally we say, I hope something, we want, we wish. I hope that this happens to me. I wish, I desire that this would happen. But in the Bible, whenever it uses the word hope, it's actually referring to the expectation that we have, the thing that we look forward to. It's like a soldier who is in combat and war, and he has a hope, he has an expectation that whenever he gets back, his family is going to be there waiting for him. That's the hope. It's the thing that he is expecting whenever he gets home. And likewise, Paul says that we have a hope. Our hope is in Christ. And the way that we're supposed to hold on to this hope, he says, is without wavering. And this can sound like, well, maybe he means that we shouldn't have doubts, you know, don't, don't feel like God isn't going to keep his promises. But I think in the context of Hebrews, what he's referring to are people who are considering leaving. They're considering leaving their confession behind because it would be easier for them. But the answer is to actually hold fast to that. A future hope is that Jesus, whenever he returns, will not come to save us because he's already accomplished that. He won't come to, well, let, me, let me clarify, he won't come to offer sacrifice for our sins because he's done that. But whenever he returns a second time, he will save those who are eagerly waiting for him at his second coming. We should keep the faith at all times. And why is the reason? The reason given is not because we are so strong, but because he who promised is faithful. There's always the temptation in the midst of suffering, in the midst of hard times in life, to leave God behind. If you've been faithful to the church, or you've sacrificed your time, you've given of your money, and you've always seemed to be faithful to God, and then something happens in your life. You get that hard diagnosis. You're tired of your family and your coworkers and your neighbors mocking you for believing in God and living a moral life. You might be tempted to give up. Or I think in our modern era, we also have the temptation not to let go of our confession, but rather to forget to hold on to it. Well, we have so many comforts that we can enjoy, and it's easy to just not think about the faith, to not think about God, because we're so comfortable. Becoming a, being a committed Christian and serving the church just falls off our list of priorities. But Hebrews would remind us to 
Think about the one who's clinging to us and to cling to him. Jesus holds us. He is the faithful one. Therefore, we should be faithful to him. So we should draw near to God. We should keep the faith. And finally, Hebrews exhorts us to help one another in the Christian life. Look at verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as, the, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The title of my sermon is The God Who Forms a Community. And the reason I chose this title is because Hebrews, and I think the whole Bible, is never just concerned with you and your personal salvation, although it is concerned with that, but it's concerned about who we are as a church. How do we help one another live the Christian life? The Bible doesn't, never imagines a Lone Ranger style of Christianity where you head off in the sunset alone to do everything. And you, sometimes people say this, well, I don't need the church to tell me how to have a relationship with God. I can have a relationship with God perfectly fine without them. But the problem with this statement is that Jesus, Paul, the apostles, and the whole Bible contradict it. Whenever Jesus sent out his disciples, did he ever send anyone out alone? No. He sent them two by two. Right, Hebrews kind of ups the ante in verse 25. Well, or rather, let me return to this. Uh, verse 19. Look at all the pronouns that the author of Hebrews uses. I'm just going to kind of skim over them really fast, but he says this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places, by the way, he opened for us. And since we have a great high priest, let us draw near with a true heart. Let us hold fast our confession. Let us stir up one another to love and good works. Now, with, the, with this picture of the Christian life, how could anyone think that they could live it alone? And the objections might continue. Well, I have Christian friends. They're sufficient for me. That's all that I need. I have other Christians in my life. But in verse 25, the author of Hebrews ups the ante. He says, we're commanded to do this, to not neglect the assembling of ourselves together, as is the habit of some, but rather we should encourage each other. And this is why coming to church is actually so important. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here because you are here at church together. But I think this is important for us to take to those who haven't been with us in a while, perhaps a very long while. But as Christians, it's necessary for us to gather. The word for church in Greek Ecclesia, you may have heard that before. The word actually means a gathering of people, an assembly of people. So to imagine being a part of a church or imagine a church that doesn't gather, that's an oxymoron. It doesn't exist. So we have to press into each other for the community of life. And I want to go back to verse 24 for just a minute. Because it says that we are to stir up one another to love and good works. Now this is an interesting way to say it, because we might expect him to say that we should love one another. Jesus said that, Paul said that, that's important. But it's actually a little different. To stir up one another. We might translate that word to agitate one another. Now, have you ever been agitated before? Have you ever been agitated before? Whenever we use that word, what do we normally mean? I'm annoyed, I'm angry. Why did you push my buttons? But here, the Hebrews uses that word to agitate us, to stir up one another, to love, and to do good works. So imagine if I knew how to push your buttons, and I go and I push them, and whenever I push them, it helps me see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. When I push your buttons, it inspires you to serve and to have mercy and compassion upon other people. Isn't that interesting? agitate one another, to love one another, and to do good works. It's such a beautiful, strange picture, but it's a beautiful picture. We need to, and how can we do this, right? I, if I don't know you as my brother or my, my sister in Christ, how can I know how to stir you up to loving good works? Well, I have to know you first. I have to know how God has gifted you and equipped you to serve in the church, how he's wired you in your makeup. So even though we are together, it doesn't mean that we don't have individuals with our own particularities, but we have to serve together in the church to stir up one another to love, not to anger. Remember, all of the privileges that God has given to us, these are responsibilities 
that we draw near to God with a true heart, that we hold fast the confession of our hope, and that we stir up one another to love and good works. And this is all made possible by Jesus Christ. Remember, it's by his atoning work on the cross and his priestly work in heaven, Jesus gives us access to the Father in order that we might live confident Christian lives in an ever hostile world. Earlier in the sermon, I asked this question. Have you ever been tempted to quit? Let me be a bit more specific now. Have you ever been tempted to quit believing? Have you ever been tempted to quit the church? Then let me follow those questions up with another. Have you ever shared that temptation? Have you ever shared that concern? If you're feeling that way, or if you've felt that way, if you've got struggles and doubts, I would encourage you to find a brother or sister in Christ who you trust, one who you know is wise, and share that concern. Right? The church should never be a place where you can't share doubts and concerns. You need a brother or a sister to walk with you through that season. Or maybe you want to quit church because you've actually been hurt or disappointed in the past. As the body of Christ, we endeavor to live peaceably with one another and to maintain the spirit of unity and the bond of peace. So here's a question today. Do you need to seek restoration with someone who has sinned against you? How can you stir up someone to love and good works if you don't have a restored relationship? Maybe you're here today and you've heard me talk about the benefits of Jesus' work as a priest and as the sacrifice for our sins. And here's the question I have for you today. Have you believed Jesus Christ? Have you trusted him for your salvation? Have you confessed your sins to him and asked for forgiveness? If you do so, what Hebrews tells us is that you will gain access to the very God of the universe. Not only can we know him, but we can depend on him. We can fellowship with him. We can bring our requests to him. And for all of you today, wherever you find yourself, maybe you feel confident today, maybe you feel doubting today, I would exhort you to do what Hebrews says in chapter 12, to look unto Jesus. Look unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Look to him because there is salvation and fullness of life. In just a second, I'm going to be standing down front, and I would love to have a chance to pray with you. Or maybe you've heard me talk about church, being a part of a church, and you're wondering if you should become a member of this church. I'd love to talk with you about that as well. And as, you, as we stand and sing in just a moment, we're going to be singing to him, we are called to be God's people. And so it would be fitting for us to know how to become one of the people of God, but also as we live and exist in the people of God, to rejoice in that together. So if you would please bow your heads with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son Jesus Christ to earth. As we think about our faith, as we think about what we believe, but also why we believe, we can always again and again point back to Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, would you help us to Take advantage of the privileges that Christ has acquired for us. God, we know that we should draw near to you, but there are times when we want to stay by ourselves. But would you help us to come to you knowing that you've purified our bodies and you've purified our conscience? God, would you help us to hold fast the confession of our hope because you who have promised are faithful to us. And God, would you show us how we might stir up one another to love and good works? as we continue to meet together week after week. Would you draw us to yourself? We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.